Hi, I um, just recently gave a presentation at the Association for Conflict Resolutions conference. Um, and I thought I would just go ahead and make a video to share um, what my little section of the presentation was. And it's about really understanding what are the sources of political and social conflict. Now, obviously, politics and social change issues are massive sources of conflict. Um, and uh, if you haven't noticed, then you probably haven't been paying much attention at all. Um, it'd be interesting to know what you're doing in your life right now. But um, so um, I'm just going to break this down a little bit and as well as share some ideas about like how do we maybe get beyond this. Um, because uh, there's something about when you understand something, then you understand how to fix it a little better as well. So, um, yeah, so the first thing is about, is a question about how do we approach um, conflict? Now, in Palel, conflict resolution or conflict transformation theory, um, there's basically three main ways of approaching conflict. The first one is based on power, and definitely we see power as a way to resolve conflict um, uh, in the world. Um, and basically what this approach means is if you wanna um, win, then you try to get yourself in power. And whoever holds power is the person who's in charge. And, um, and if you don't have power, then you lose. And you could imagine hypothetically, you know, there being an election and like paying attention about like who's gonna win, and who's gonna be in power and then who's gonna lose. Um, another sort of win-lose approach that we also sort of see come up in political and social issues is um, a rights-based approach. And that basically is asking the question is who is right in the eyes of the law? And this is where we see people talk about justice and we talk about lack of justice. And sometimes we don't like the laws that are happening and so there's resistance to those. People might try to change the laws. Um, or we go to court or we try to get some sort of authority to um, adjudicate and say who's the winner or the loser and who's the, who's the right person. Now, there's a couple of challenges here. With the rights-based approach, first of all, most of those laws are made by people with power. And so it doesn't really get us out of this power situation very much. The other piece is, is that both of these kinds of situations create winners and losers, um, and um, and that's great if you're on the winning side. But if you're on the losing side, that's no fun, and it doesn't really work. Especially when we're talking about the kinds of issues that we deal with um, when we're dealing with political and social issues. Um, oops, here we go. <laughs> Trying to do this with the video and everything like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, because the possibility of losing when we're dealing with political and social issues is intense because the things that we're talking about are sort of life or death issues. There's stuff about just like our very well-being, not just our own, but it's about like the next generation and the next generation, like the issues that we're dealing with around political and social issues um, are really intense and really important. And the idea of losing in these kinds of situations is intolerable. So that means that we have to win. And that creates this idea that if we don't win, then some sort of horrible other reality is going to happen. And that is what gets us so, it gets these situations to be so intractable and so polarized. And as conflict increases, that polarization increases. And then, of course, then we actually will start dehumanizing each other and separating from each other. Um, and you know, and it gets to the sense that like whoever wins or loses has these cosmic consequences. And um, I suppose that's something that we can also sort of see um, as something that's kind of up in the world these days. So the third way of approaching conflict is to find a win-win solution. And this in the world of mediation and conflict resolution is called an interest-based approach. Now the idea of an interest-based approach is that you're trying to find out what the underlying interests or the underlying needs are for everyone involved. The idea here is that when we look at people's deep underlying human needs, those are actually not ever gonna be in conflict with each other because we all have the same needs. 
we all have the same need for dignity and peace and um, and love and connection and we have a need for respect and um, autonomy and agency and so all these things we can all recognize um, and um, so when we can actually talk about well what do you actually need what do I actually need right now what are our interests in this situation um, Oftentimes the solution is like a lot easier to find and that's basically like the secret of conflict resolution um, And this leads to this idea of omni partiality and if anybody wants to help me figure this out I would love for this to be like the word of the year like within the next five years or something omni partiality means a bias in favor of everyone and this is a way to think beyond not just being neutral because we're none of us are neutral we all care about something but instead what if we were partial to the omni to the all to the everyone what would it be like for me to be partial towards you towards me towards us towards the community around us our country to the whole world to the planet and just Let's just let's just be biased in favor of everyone. Um, by the way, if you want to learn more about this, you can go to duncanautrycom slash omnipartiality, and I have a whole essay about this. Um, anyways, um, if we want, if we bring this kind of approach, we're trying to sort of understand like what, why is the issue really important to you, and why is it really important to me? That invites this attitude of curiosity and creativity, empathy, unity, collaboration while also living in our differences and having diverse perspectives. And that is something that can be really powerful, especially because it's part of like the key um, components of what conflict is. So now interest-based approaches sound a little Pollyanna-ish, but let me just share some of these definitions of politics that from an interest-based perspective that might sort of like, sort of open up the possibility here. So one thing we can do is we can think about politics is basically a social problem solving process um, the system, the constitution, the democracy that we're in, recognize that there's a diversity of views about whatever the different issue is. And the more people we have looking at something, the more ways that we can understand what the actual nature of a problem is. And the more perspectives, that gives us a more precise understanding of what the nature of a problem, of, of any given issue is. And that actually does help us create better and more sustainable solutions which um, uh, is, is really helpful because um, if we can think about politics as this like kind of just large group decision-making process, then we also understand that the more that we can sort of agree on the kind of decisions that we're making, if we can find processes for making decisions that don't have this like win-lose sort of outcome, then more people will agree with the decision and then actually that's going to make the decision more sustainable because more people will be on board with actually just keeping it going forward and do the sort of work that it's going to take because every decision we make is only going to work if people actually participate and continue to be involved in it and so being um, able to have decision making processes that include a whole large group of people um, is much it's a much more effective way of doing this people <laughs> um and the last thing is it's really worthwhile thinking about just politics is just a conflict resolution process and um it's really part of like the brilliance of the constitution is that basically it anticipated that wow people are going to be disagreeing about how we manage our country and how we manage um all the important decisions forever and so they've created a very clever system. Now it's like, there's a lot of things that are happening in the modern day that they didn't quite anticipate back in, in the 1770s and 1780s, but um, they, uh, it's a very clever conflict resolution process. Um, and um, but the way we can sort of make it even better is by recognizing that it's possible, there's actually more than one possible solution here we might have a lot of different ways of approaching the different issues and that also then opens up that creativity especially when we can understand that we're trying to do work in around political and social issues in ways that no one loses and um and that it's okay if others win sometimes um because we're all in this together people that's that's a fact so um i'm going to talk a little bit about sort of like what 
are like the core ingredients of a political or social conflict. Um, and, you know, this helps us understand why um, potentially, you know, productive political disagreements about important social issues turn into unproductive conflicts. Um, and so if you want to have an unproductive conflict, here's the three ingredients you're going to need. You're going to have to have diversity of opinions and perspectives. You need to like two or more people, two or more groups um, with different ideas, different beliefs, different ideas, different opinions, different needs, different values, and different interests, um, uh, all sort of competing um, to get their, their like their voices heard. And um, so obviously diversity can be is is a core ingredient of good enough to conflict. But also remember that diversity is what actually helps us get better perspective, um, more precise, more sustainable, more effective um, outcomes. The more different perspectives, beliefs, ideas, opinions, needs, and values, and interests that can be part of a decision-making process or of a solution, um, the better it's going to be. Um, and any organization, um, you know, can really learn how to benefit from just like, how can we get more people with different kinds of lived experiences looking at things? It's going to be a much more robust, um, and powerful uh, organization. So uh, another ingredient for um, you know, political and social disagreement is inequality, right? Um, now, you need to, there has to be an imbalance of power between individuals or groups, and especially power in their capacity to implement all of their different ideas and beliefs and opinions and values and so on. And um, and I just want to point out here that this is th actually sort of a natural thing, that there's always going to be people who have more information, um, more uh, with more access, more time, um, you know, the ability to sort of like implement the reality that you really want to live in is different for different folks. And um, uh, I'll talk in, in the sort of the next slide about how we might sort of try to address this. Um, but it's worth remembering that politics, like by definition, is basically a system for regulating imbalances of power, or is like, how do we deal with power? Um, who do we give power to? How do we um, share power? And, um, and so trying to find a way of like getting the system to work, even though we all have different amounts of power, is um, like, is the whole point of the system. Like that is what makes something a political issue is there being an imbalance of power. And in a certain way, there's ways that we could make that less imbalanced, but we're not gonna get it to total equality. So um, that, you know, so I'll talk about that in the next slide a little more. So the third thing you need to make a good political social conflict um, <laughs> that's unproductive is an adversarial process. If you set the system up where someone's gonna win and someone's gonna lose, um, and you take all these diverse individuals with different amounts of power and you pit them against each other and making someone win or lose, like that's going to get you into trouble. And um, now people, we spent a lot of time thinking about the problems um, either that arise from diversity or the problems that arise from inequality. But we don't actually spend a lot of time talking about the problems that are arising from the very decision-making process that we're using. Um, so there's different ways that we can sort of try to deal with these. Um, and uh, yeah, so we we'll try to bring these things into balance. So remember, we need to figure out how to bring into balance diversity, inequality, and um, the fact that we have an adversarial process. So one thing people can do is try to decrease diversity. Now, um, there's a way that um, when people are talking about like the concerns, for example, of like white supremacy, you know, is basically like, let's try to have there be a specific kind of culture that is going to be the exact, you know, the right way of being things that's sort of like some sort of European lineage. 
and then we won't have any more disagreements because everyone who's in power all thinks about things in the same way. Um, so that, you know, of course, is a way of decreasing diversity that is um, under a lot of uh, criticism, very due um, criticism and challenge right now. Um, but we also can think about how decreasing diversity is just only hanging out with people who have the same political beliefs as you. Um, and we know, um, I think everyone in the world except for me has watched the movie, uh, the documentary, The Social Dilemma. But we know that like in our little social Facebook bubbles, we're only getting exposed to people who have similar beliefs as us. And then and there's this tendency to sort of like unfriend the people who we disagree with or like stop talking to people. And that's another way of decreasing diversity. If you're only hanging out with people who have the same political beliefs as you, that's a really easy way to get rid of conflicts. Because if you all agree um, and everyone has the same perspective or the same background and the same values, then no more conflict. So that's one way you can deal with that. Um, I'm not necessarily the best, but it's, it's a strategy. So another thing you can do is try to increase equality. Now, this is really important. You know, like obviously there are ways that we have systemic ways that um, of inequality in this world and trying to just bring more equality into our system um, is really powerful. And, um, and that can be, this can be like accomplished in lots of different ways. Um, one is to just like, give more time or information or resources to the people who don't have that, right? Um, and if we want to start dealing with the systemic issues, it's worthwhile thinking like way upstream, like where, you know, like if someone's getting a different education when they're younger or they're like dealing with, you know, challenging circumstances as a child, like, and like, how is that going to set them up? to like get into adulthood, you know, or we can look at any sort of field. Um, you know, I think about tech, but definitely in the mediation field, you know, it's like, what would it be like to make it, this field be more accessible to people of diverse perspectives and for people to have, you know, share of power. So increasing equality is a great strategy, um, but we're not gonna get it to perfection, you know? So what's the other thing we can do? We can change the process. Now, this is where I light up because um, we don't have to have an adversarial win lose process. There's a lot better ways we can do this kind of thing. Um, and so, what would it look like to sort of think about a dis like creating a process that um, that is leading to more interest based solutions, omni partial outcomes, um, and collaborative kind of decision making? So here are some ways that you can assess the political, social decision-making process that you're using um, to see whether or not it's moving more towards a, um, uh, you know, a collaborative, interest-based, win-win solutions. So if one thing you want to do is check out the content. So first of all, are you even clear what the issue is about? Right, and that's actually really important, a really powerful thing that you can do is like you can move any conflict like 50% of the way forward by just trying to come to agreement about what is the question we're trying to answer here, what is the problem that we're trying to deal with. Now, if you can get everyone just to agree with like, what is the question that everyone can agree is an interesting question, you've done a whole bunch to sort of move the issue forward. Oftentimes, what we're doing and actually doing is trying to decide between two specific solutions. So the whole issue gets framed as, um, do we have this or do we have that? And um, and like and you could debate that forever. But then if you say, okay, well, what if we have this is going to give us some is trying to address a problem a certain way. And if we do this, it's gonna give us a solution to a certain kind of problem. Well, what is the problem that both of these things are trying to address? And just figure out what is the actual thing that both sides are trying to deal with. Um, and, um, and so if you can turn the goal into just actually trying to understand and transform what that situation is, you can do a whole bunch 
And then another thing you can start thinking about is like, what are the underlying needs here? Like, why, why do we care about this? Um, and um, I also just point out that content is also like, do people even have the same information about what they're talking about? Um, doing some great information sharing can be a really powerful way to sort of move um, something forward. Um, and so the reason why you and like these two different sides or multiple sides are trying to deal with a certain issue, and the reason why they're in conflict is because they're in relationship with each other. So trying to understand what even is this relationship? How do we, how did we get to be the people who need to be making this decision? And so the once you start asking that, and this is a great way of dealing with some of this diversity and also some of these inequality questions, is you can ask, okay, is everyone who has a stake in this problem, in this issue, um, are they here in the process for trying to make a decision? Um, and if so, great. Now that might feel like you've just put a bunch of critters in the cage and it seems like too much, um, too, you know, like everyone's gonna fight with each other. Um, and there's ways of dealing with that. But if you're missing people, um, you know, if you, for example, like have decreased diversity by excluding certain people, um, who's missing? Who actually is gonna to need to be involved in the decision? Um, and why are they not here? How have they been marginalized? Um, and what would it actually take to make the process more inclusive? Now, sometimes it's kind of saying like, well, we can't have those people here. Um, well, why not? And like, think about that. Whatever's at the, pro the, the heart of that, that thing, is important. Maybe you don't feel ready, or maybe your power has not been balanced enough. You know, like um, maybe you don't feel like there's enough structure, or maybe there's not enough respect. You're gonna have to figure it out. Um, and um, and if you do have everyone together, what is the quality of the relationships? Do people trust each other? Do people respect each other? Do people even just acknowledge each other's mutual dignity? These are the kinds of um, things that can be really important. And I'll just kind of say here, um, you know, it's worthwhile to focus on relationships and connection before you get to the content. You know, sometimes it's just worth getting to know who each other are um, first um, and get to just relate as humans and then get into the issues. Um, so anyways, that's a little hint there. Um, and then the process. What kind of process are you doing here? Um, you know, is there a path to actually coming to collaborative decision making? Like, is there a space here for um, creative um, exploration of different ideas? Um, or is it just a process that's gonna have a winner and a loser? And, um, and, uh, and like, you know, another piece is, is like, does your process have space for the people who are involved to actually talk about why it's a meaningful thing to them and like really talk about not only what they care about, but why they care about it? Is it is there space here to sort of understand what the deeper underlying personal human issues are in a given situation? And I'll just like say as an example of like a process, um, I know that today is just gonna be the, the last um, presidential debate in the United States. And um, and without even knowing what's going to be happening, I can be sure about a couple things. That the moderator is going to be asking questions about a bunch of really important issues that people care about, right? And each of those issues really require a ton of nuanced, thoughtful, deliberative, informed collaborative discussion and decision making like really they all merit a lot of energy and i also can be sure that um the setup where each person's going to have two minutes to talk and then a couple minutes to sort of shout at each other about it is not going to move it forward because the process is trying to figure out who wins and who loses and we all win or we all lose. Like we either figure out how to address those questions or we don't. But having like someone win or lose a debate about something 
isn't actually moving us forward. Now, I understand that this is part of a bigger process um, and, you know, debates um, entertaining and all those things, but it's definitely not a useful way for us to figure out how to make the best decisions. Um, and so this brings us to um, the three rules of transforming conflict. Um, and you can find this at my website. It's duncanautry.com slash three dash rules. Um, and uh, so the first rule of transforming conflict is just remember the conflict is usually not about what it's about, right? Um, like the debate's not about who wins an election. Um, it's actually about what do we want the future of our country to be, right? The debate's not, you know, an example that I always like to use is, I think it's not about um, who, uh, clean, you know, like it's not about who cleaned the dishes or didn't clean the dishes. It's actually about respect and consideration and, um, and you know, mutual acknowledgement and so forth. And it's like, you know, so there's always something else there. So figure out what the, deeper personal human interests are in, behind every conflict it helps a lot the second rule of conflict is that everyone who's involved in the conflict is going to have to be involved in the solution there's no way out of this and anyone who's excluded in the process of finding a solution is either going to resist the solution that you come up with or they're going to involve themselves on their own terms either by coming up with their own solution um, and trying to resist it or changing things down the road um, and, uh, the last piece, you know, and this comes to that idea of like, when in doubt, work on connection first and then get into the content. The third rule for transforming conflict is remember that the process for transforming a conflict and the outcome are actually the same thing. There really isn't that much of a separation between the ends and the means. Um, and um, so whatever qualities that you infuse in the process of trying to solve a conflict, or transform a conflict, are actually going to be defining what the qualities of that outcome or that next reality is going to be. So if you want a, an outcome that's inclusive um, and meets the interests of everyone, then you're going to have to include everyone and talk about what those interests are, for example. Um, and just remember that it, Actually, the outcome is just a new process. It's not like you're going to get to some sort of fixed state and then it'll all be done. Um, if you, even if you decide to come to an agreement about some sort of new way of being in relationship, like that's just going to be opening to a new process. So the process is just creating more process, which brings us to the fourth of the three rules of conflict. There isn't going to be a final outcome especially around these political and social issues, we're in an ongoing relationship with each other. You know, there's this an illusion right now. I had a friend say that um, it seems like we're all about ready to go to like divorce court and like people are gonna, judge is gonna decide who gets the kids, but no one's moving out of the house. We're still gonna be in relationship with each other. And so the question then becomes, it's not about what, do you want to see happen? Instead, is how do we want to be in relationship with each other? So um, thank you for listening to this video. Um, it's longer than the recommended Facebook video. And if you want to learn more about any of this, you can check me out at duncanautry.com. And part of this was a presentation as part of a group that I'm in called the Democracy, Politics, and Conflict Engagement Initiative. Um, or the DPACE initiative. And you can find out more information that, about that at the dpaceinitiative.org. That's D-P-A-C-E initiative.org. And I also bring all these skills to businesses and all of this applies to teams that are trying to figure out what to do. And you can find out more about that at spokeandwheel.co. Spoke and Wheel is my um, company where we do team relationship development. So thank you for watching this, um, and you're welcome to reach out and add some comments to this video. would love to hear your thoughts and reactions about it. Share it, whatever you want to do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.